So I am delighted to be here um, and really delighted to talk to you about sort of the continuation of what Dr. Maldonado was talking about and really focus on um, sort of the, the public health implementation of a lot of the guidance that was discussed both um, at the CDC level and because I have this unique opportunity right now to work as Georgia's uh, chief medical officer, um, also talk about things um, sort of from a state perspective. So very delightful, delighted to be here today with you all. I don't have any uh, conflicts to disclose. And what I'll be talking about first is what makes uh, people with disabilities an at-risk pop population. Then I'm going to move into um, vaccine issues and specifically talk a little bit about prioritization and then the application of that in, at the state level about safety and accessibility. Then I'll be talking to you about some of the work we've been doing at CDC within my Division of Human Development and Disability to look at the impact on children and young people of the COVID pandemic in general, and then talk to you about some practices and finally provide some resources. So first, I'm talking about uh, people with disabilities um, as an at-risk population. So what we know about uh, the risk for COVID-19 is that it's complicated. So disability alone may not be related to higher risk in some cases for getting COVID-19 or having severe illness. However, um, as Dr. Maldonado was talking about, you know, there are a lot of things that contribute to risk. Some of those are sort of inherent or related to medical issues. And some of those are sort of that larger context. So, People, some people with disabilities may be at higher risk for getting COVID-19 or for um, uh, having severe complications because many have close contact with care providers. They may have trouble understanding information or practicing some of those prevention measures such as being able to wear a mask or um, a social distancing or it may be the context in where they live. They may live in a long-term care home. They may live in a community-based uh, group home. So whether it's some of that context or whether it's actually inherent to um, some of the medical or underlying conditions, there are many reasons that put uh, people with disabilities at risk for uh, complications from COVID-19. Um, uh, in speaking a little bit about underlying conditions, we know um, that people with disabilities uh, have, um, many have uh, conditions that put them at higher risk for severe illness and that adults with disabilities are, have up to three times, be, are up to three times more likely to have uh, things like heart disease, diabetes and cancer than adults without disabilities. There is a list, and in fact, this list is talked about quite frequently um, and debated in, in many cases of underlying conditions that put a person at higher risk for COVID-19 on the CDC webpage. The way that list has been put together is they look at the published literature and as um, sufficient evidence comes up for a particular condition that's placed on this list that is included of underlying conditions in COVID-19. Some of the conditions in ad adults um, that are put people at higher risk for severe illness are cancer, chronic kidney disease, uh, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure or cardiomyopathies, being immunocompromised, obesity um, certainly, uh, as we heard, is a big risk factor in children, also a big risk factor in adults, um, a sickle cell disease, a smoking, type 2 diabetes. So what I think is important to remember about this list is this is looking at what um, the science has produced in the last year. We realize there are many things that may have not been put on that list of as far as um, things that put you, may put you at risk for complications. And that's because the, the, the literature isn't out there. And so that list is continuing to be um, updated. One of the conditions um, that is on the list that I want to go into a little more detail on is Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is currently listed as a higher risk condition for COVID-19. And that's because there have been quite a few studies that have looked at the data specifically in people with Down syndrome. And um, the data supports uh, this finding of high risk. 
Um, and there was enough data to show that sort of Down syndrome in and of itself separate from uh, co-occurring medical conditions um, was associated with severe COVID-19 illness. There have been a lot of questions about intellectual and developmental disabilities and other disabilities that may not be on this underlying conditions list. And um, part of the challenge there is that most of the literature that's been published to date um, has not sort of taken out the co-occurring conditions such as diabetes, obesity, um, you know, lung disease, some of the things that I named before, um, and sort of isolated out the disability itself as being a high-risk condition. It doesn't mean that we don't that um, we don't understand that being a person with a disability um, in many, many cases puts people at higher risk for um, complications from COVID-19, either because of their higher risk for um, uh, getting to the disease because of um, certain conditions or possibly having underlying conditions. And so um, one last thing I wanted to say before I move on is that depending on the state plan, um, people with disabilities are in different places as far as eligibility and priority of a vaccination. And so it can create a lot of complications depending on um, where you're looking, uh, you know, how people with disabilities fit, fit into that overall plan, um, both for um, mitigation, but uh, also for um, vaccine prioritization. So now I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about vaccine issues. Um, as we heard, um, three vaccines have been have received emergency use authorization from the FDA. The Pfizer BioNTech is two doses given 21 days apart. Moderna, two doses given 28 days apart. And the Johnson & Johnson Janssen product that is one dose. All of these vaccines, as we've heard, were tested in tens of thousands of adults from diverse backgrounds, including older adults, communities of color, and have been proven effective in preventing illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19. It's not known how long the protection from these vaccines may last, and that's part of the reason for that recommendation to um, continue to the other prevention measures. I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail, but I need this um, just sort of to set up some of the conversation I have in a little bit. But as we heard, the ACIP has made recommendations based on science and then ethical principles. So maximizing benefits and implement, in, minimizing harms, mitigating health inequities, promoting ju justice, and then promoting transparency. So these are the different um, uh, principles, ethical principles that were put into place as the, the ACIP put recommendations into place for uh, vaccine prioritization. So you'll he see here, um, and this is just a different uh, schematic of how uh, Dr. Maldonado showed it earlier, different um, categories of populations that were put into the different phases. And these are the recommendations that were put out for priority populations by the ACIP. And I think it's really important to note that um, even though we're seeing in different states, many different sort of applications of what's on here, these are still, the, this still provides a really good guide to understand um, where the, the um, high risk populations are and um, where public health should continue to focus, um, even as in some states, like so I'm in the state of Georgia right now, where actually um, today every, every Georgian over the age of 16 became eligible for a vaccine. Even though that's the case, um, the public health entities are focusing on specific categories of populations to make sure that they're reaching you know, hard to reach groups within those categories, whether that's essential workers, whether that's uh, people with underlying conditions that may also be a minority or may also, uh, you know, live in a county where the social vulnerability index is very high. And so keeping this in context, even though states are applying this in different ways, I think is very, very important. Um, you know, and this just, you know, re reinforces what I what I just said is that states and jurisdictions do have that uh, ultimate ability to determine prioritization for vaccine based on their uh, local context. 
and uh, the needs within the communities where uh, they see that greatest risk. So people with disabilities can be included in any prioritization phase, um, depending on how you look at this. So um, some states have included people with disabilities in a, what they call a phase 1A or a phase 1B. Um, they also uh, have, um, some states have decided to allow providers to use clinical judgment to determine the patient's priority given their overall health status. So if they are looking, um, in, in some cases, uh, people with disabilities, it's really the way they become eligible for a vaccine is more based on the underlying medical conditions they have as opposed to their status maybe as a person with disability. Um, it, you know, the, it is um, very complicated because every state health department has made different decisions about where people with disabilities fit. Um, some have called that out explicitly, others have integrated it into the rest of their state plan. I, the last thing I sort of want to say about prioritization of people with disabilities within vaccine eligibility is that it's also important to remember the piece of people with disabilities fit into many of those other categories that ACIP put forward, such as being, they may be a healthcare worker, they may be an essential worker, they may be a caregiver, they may be a person with underlying conditions or a number of those things. So um, uh, it's certainly not simple, um, but uh, people with disabilities are um, prioritized in many, uh, many states um, for vaccination. There's been a lot of discussion about um, caregiver prioritization and what the definition of a caregiver means. Um, when we uh, look at what ACIP published in late December, they talked about defined healthcare providers as those people who are paid and unpaid who have um, contact or indirect contact with patients or infectious materials. So this could include a direct service provider, uh, someone that works in hospice, home health care or group home providers. And they um, either, uh, so, so they would be considered a healthcare worker. They're also considered an essential worker. So they're prioritized within these phase one uh, subcategories. In addition, in some states, parents and caregivers who provide support to people with disabilities, whether, whether those are children or um, adults with disabilities, might have fallen into this category with the reasoning that um, because of legislation many, many years ago that um, uh, caused a deinstitutionalization of people with disabilities um, and the idea that people should be able to get services in their community um, that they would have gotten before in an institution, it meant that many family uh, caregivers or unpaid caregivers were providing um, sort of the equivalent of healthcare in their home. So in quite a few states, um, family caregivers um, or unpaid caregivers have been prioritized quite high in the list of people who are eligible for vaccine. So when we look at eligibility of children, we've, we've heard this, but right now, just for, for reiter, reiterization, um, Pfizer, uh, Bio, and Entech is approved for those above 16 years of age. Moderna and jo the Janssen or Johnson and Johnson product are both 18 years and older. And um, we know that there are trials ongoing the, where those numbers will come down. So the ages in which, um, uh, children are eligible will come down hopefully in the next coming months. Uh, when we look at safety of COVID vaccines for people with disabilities, I wanted to reiterate that, you know, uh, the safety precautions that were put into place um, to arrive at an emergency use authorization through the FDA and then ultimate recommendation by the ACIP um, is the same uh, process that went in, has gone into place with other vaccines. So COVID-19 vaccines are no different than um, the protocols that are in place to ensure safety and efficacy of vaccines in the US. There's no data to suggest that people with disabilities report different or more severe side effects. 
um, COVID-19 vaccines are held to those same uh, safety standards. And there's a robust uh, system in place for monitoring of vaccine safety. So not only is there the VAERS system, the vaccine uh, adverse event monitoring system there where people can report um, uh, side effects, whether that's a healthcare provider or um, a person themselves to the VAERS system uh, to, to be further investigated as a, kind of a passive surveillance system that's looking at side effects for vaccines. You can do that with COVID, that is in place for other vaccines. In addition to that, there's also the VSAFE uh, program, which uh, was established for COVID-19 vaccines. This is something that every person who gets vaccinated in the US with a COVID vaccine is offered participation. It's something that is either web-based or it's on a smartphone and people can sign up for that. It will ask you every day for a number of weeks what your symptoms are and how those symptoms have affected you. For example, have they affected you so that you're not able to um, go to work or you had to call a physician, something like that. And then they space out a little bit. And then if you got a vaccine that is a two dose vaccine, they will again um, remind you that you needed your second dose and then go through that process again. This VSAFE system, hundreds of thousands of people have signed up to use it. And it's an active surveillance uh, system because it's monitoring side effects in real time. And so that information is going back to CDC. CDC is doing analysis to look at the profiles of side effects in uh, all of these vaccines. So this is um, just a few resources and I've got resources throughout these that you can refer to in the slides that you received. But uh, CDC created a playbook for states um, and jurisdictions to assist with um, understanding how to roll out a uh, vaccine within the states. Within there, there's some information about vaccine considerations for people with disabilities, also vaccinating older adults and people with disabilities, and then more focused on um, considerations one might have at actual vaccination sites. So now I'm gonna move into talking a little bit about some of the other uh, projects that we have ongoing at CDC that are looking further at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on children and uh, young people. So as we know, um, uh, the pandemic has adversely affected children in many ways. They've had to change uh, their everyday routines, schools have been open and closed, and um, many may not be getting routine health care. They've missed uh, visiting with outside family members and events that are part of growing up, like going to birthday parties or um, you know, socializing. And, um, many may not feel as safe or secure in this time of uncertainty. So I'm going to talk a little more in detail about some of the projects that are underway um, to look at this. So first are um, the ACT Early COVID-19 response teams. So before um, COVID, the Learn the Signs Act Early team at CDC supported ACT Early uh, ambassadors um, across the state. And really their job was to um, help people understand uh, what materials were out there related to Lauren the Science Act early to identify children early with uh, developmental delay as well as educate parents about milestones. So what we thought was important is that we could use that Act Early Ambassador system. We had people across the country, but enhance that or give more funding so that they could um, uh, work to enhance those early childhood systems to identify children with delay within um, the, the COVID um, pandemic. So with CARES Act funding, we supported uh, 43 state and territory, territory Act Early COVID-19 response teams. Um, these are teams that are now uh, assembled and really looking at um, you know, how can you in this context where a lot of children were kind of missing um, uh, appointments for developmental screening um, to make sure that there were tools out there targeting populations that might be at risk. And then also looking at how one could improve resiliency among children and families um, 
in this time of um, uh, this time of challenge for um, the pandemic. Another uh, thing that we were certainly aware of was that, you know, the, the developmental screening um, was not happening as much, uh, as well as immunization, as well as all of those things that happen at well child visits, including anticipatory guidance and things like that. So we partnered with the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, their early childhood champions, the act early ambassadors with a state childhood early intervention programs and then uh, pediatricians to uh, identify promising practices for key components of health, pediatric health supervision visits um, and looking at some of the things that were being done to um, mitigate the fact that there wasn't as much in-person uh, visits for, for well child care. Um, and so this is another project that is still ongoing, but the idea was that we needed to remember all of the things that the children were missing in those systems that support kind of well child care connection to systems and make sure that um, there were best practices shared, but also a reestablishment of the health promotion in young children. Um, then there are also some resources that have been developed um, and then translated uh, to promote emotional well being and resilience for children and uh, young people. So these were things that um, were uh, information about cognitive behavioral therapy approaches that were developed into online tools uh, with the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that helped parents. Um, cope and children cope with stress and anxiety. And I do have lists of all of these resources at the end of the slides. And then um, I think this is the, the final one I wanted to share with you is, you know, we also struggled with some of the research um, things that we were doing at CDC because we could no longer do that in the context of the pandemic. So specifically um, our uh, seed program or our study to explore early development had to suspend their in person assessments for autism spectrum disorders um, due to the COVID pandemic. And so we shifted that funding to um, look at the impact in states of some of the prevention efforts that were going on. Um, and look at sort of changes in services and skills, uh, uh, behavior and functioning of children with autism spectrum disorders, and then look at some of the other things that were going on. So some of the examples um, in Arkansas, the state team was using parent navigators as part of their trainings to train um, residents, family practice members, and uh, sorry, family practice residents, as well as providers in training. Um, in New Jersey, uh, they developed a train the trainer curriculum um, to support pediatric residents uh, to understand um, the important services that children with autism spectrum disorders should uh, get. Um, Colorado used their state team to do um, training on learn the signs act early with their pediatricians. And then um, Hawaii did something similar, but they were also training their pediatric residents. So there was a need to sort of shift funding. And then a lot of this funding was used to look at how people were um, reapplying what was going on in the context of the pandemic to support um, both the identification and um, uh, both the identification and then the treatment of children with autism spectrum disorders and delays. So finally, I wanted to talk to you about some of the things that are going on in states related to vaccination of people with disabilities. Um, in some states, uh, there are uh, activities that are underway to um, create kind of special events for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities where vaccine can be received in a place that is familiar to that person with disability. So in one case, um, or in one state, uh, there's a partnership with public health with a pharmacy partner and then a disability organization. Um, and what happens is the disability organization facilitates the sign up of uh, for vaccine 
and then is the host when the pharmacy partner, in this case is Walgreens, comes in and uh, provides the vaccination. And these events are happening sort of 100 to 200 people at a time. Um, and uh, what we have heard from these events that have happened is that it minimizes some of those behavioral reactions that someone may be having, a person with intellectual or developmental disabilities may have related to getting a vaccine because they are in a familiar place. Some of those are minimized. Um, there's an understanding of how to approach people with disabilities. And it may be a better um, solution than maybe a sort of a mass vaccination slight with um, a drive-through that is, that is sort of not as um, focused on the care of people with disabilities. A second sort of part of that is that it also provides an opportunity to educate um, pharmacy techs and pharmacists who might not normally work a lot with people with intellectual disability to learn a bit more about how to provide um, appropriate healthcare. Um, these events, I think it's important to realize are small. And so some people would say, well, you know, we're trying to get as many shots into arms as possible. Um, but, you know, I think you need both approaches. You need sort of the big mass sites, but then you also need these small sites. And whether it's people with disabilities or whether it's a hesitant popu minority population or something like that, sometimes these um, sort of more intensive uh, planning events uh, get to a hard to reach population. And ultimately, as Dr. Maldonado said, we have a goal of vaccination of the whole population. And so different approaches are needed for different um, uh, populations. There have been also supportive materials created to support people with disabilities, such as videos in American Sign Language on how to register, um, social stories that have been written for people with autism on what to expect when you go to get a vaccination, whether it's a one vaccine, a two vaccine, a drive-through or going into a clinic. And then there's been some creative ways of thinking about reimbursement for um, particularly adults with disabilities that aren't able to get to a vaccine site. So based on um, maybe a get out the vote um, uh, campaign where there was reimbursement of individuals um, or um, vans to get people to vaccination sites, that model that was used in a get out to the vote uh, manner is now being applied to, you know, go get a shot. Um, and some of the state governments are, are providing uh, reimbursement for that. And then others are working with faith-based leaders to um, assist with the registration. So registration in most states is um, done uh, through computer platforms. And some of those are just not accessible for people with disabilities. And so there's a need almost for navigators to help people sign up. Even sometimes making a phone call isn't the way a person with a, an adult with a disability may be able to do that. And so therefore having navigators um, to help people sign up or come to events in a community setting are really important. So now I wanted to share a few um, resources that I referred to behind, but before, um, here is a parent resource kit. Um, this is um, focused on social, emotional, and mental well being um, and can be accessed on the CDC site. Um, here's a toolkit for people with disabilities. Um, this has uh, resources that can be used, guidance and planning uh, documents, as well as web resources and uh, frequently asked questions that help to provide information about vaccine, making it accessible. And there's also um, been a huge effort at CDC to make sure there's alternative formats, whether that's American Sign Language uh, videos, things for low vision, um, also easy read um, type uh, materials for uh, people that have may have extreme low literacy needs. Um, these are just um, the link to some of those uh, American Sign Language videos. We have been partnering with the Institute, uh, uh, Georgia Tech uh, Institute, so the Georgia Institute of Technology or Georgia Tech, um, they have a center for innovation. And this is a place that um, has pr provided a lot of assistance for us in translating these resources into accessible formats. 
And finally, um, the toolkit for people with disabilities, this goes all the way back to a lot of the mitigation um, practices that are also there to support people with disabilities, and then the vaccine related resources.